Thank you, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar, for a very insightful speech. And thank you as well, Dr. Haidar Bagir and Dr. Maud Faisal, for your insights earlier. We are um, uh, very appreciative of all the ideas and um, um, uh, insights shared this afternoon. Um, we would like to open the floor for questions, um, but prior to that, uh, I would plead to the participants to, um, who would like to share the questions with us or any remarks to identify themselves um, as well as be as concise as possible. We would like to take three questions at one round and then proceed with the comments and in other further insights from our panel. Assalamualaikum and very good uh, afternoon. Um, my name is Azha. I'm from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, my question is, uh, I think, is quite philosophical. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Haidar Bakhir. This is the, related to the idea of Trinity that uh, you mentioned just now. That you are saying that Trinity in Christianity is monotheistic and Tawhid. Now, uh, where is the idea of shirk? First, and my comment is that uh, the word Trinity is very normal and general. For me, it is the idea of three. It does not mean that Trinity uh, necessarily uh, monotheistic and at the same time not necessarily tripartite ideas. <coughs> because in Islam also, if we talk about Trinity, maybe people uh, don't agree with me. It's okay. But the idea of three itself exists in Islam. There is Allah, Muhammad, and Jibril. The idea of three. I'm not saying this is uh, shirik or whatsoever, but I'm just saying it as a raw idea of the tripartite idea of entity. <coughs> so, if we go back and look at Plato itself, he also introduces the idea of Trinity by the existing of world of ideas, and we have a primordial world, and we do have Demiurge who help the world of ideas to transform into primordial world. So that is also the idea of three. And the, that idea of three is totally quantitative. It means three as three. But in Islam also, Allah, Muhammad, and uh, Jibreel, it's also quantitative, totally different. And uh, your question to wait, Dr. Haidar? Wait, wait. Uh, Dr. Bakhil will understand. <laughs> okay, it's especially meant to him. <laughs> so, but in Trinity, within Christianity, it is uh, qualitative, uh, sorry, quantitative, because God as a, a father, God as a son, and God as a uh, Holy Spirit. So it shows that the idea of three in Christianity, it, does, it is not monotheistic, it is tripartite. When we say tripartite, it has to go to the realm of shirk, associationism. Therefore, in Hinduism also, we have the idea of three. But it is also, I mean, uh, tripartianism. It is not monotheistic. So therefore, the idea of three that uh, I understood, yes, in every religion we can have the idea of trinity, but is it quantitatively different 
or qualitatively different? Because we have mentioned that uh, Would Trinity, you kindly in, be brief? Well, well, Trinity in Christianity is uh, attributed to God. Thank you. So, uh, thank you. My name is uh, my name is Ali, and um, I'm a CEO of an organization called Istanbul Network for Liberty. Um, so, actually, uh, my question is, is like general for all the panelists. I'm like to draw their attention uh, based upon uh, their own discussion. Um, I would say I, I totally agree with all the three speakers here. I think they have added a lot of knowledge in terms of uh, uh, you know history of thought and uh, history of politics and uh, you know uh, both in in the local context and also regional and global context. Very, uh, I, I think it's very all uh, definitely informative. But when we come to uh, today's problem uh, in the Muslim society. Initially, I think, um, uh, if I'm not wrong, Elma, you also mentioned in your initial uh, points that uh, these problems occur now mostly in Muslim-dominated societies. Um, and so I'd like to, uh, in the, my question is, uh, the panelists would like to share their thoughts on what kind of legal uh, instruments uh, what kind of public policies, uh, you know, y in your opinion, should be adopted in the Muslim societies vis-a-vis -vis religious freedom? Uh, because that has become an important issue in terms of the public policy. I mean, you know, of course, people would react. There, uh, there, uh, you know, the mobs come out uh, everywhere. I come from Pakistan originally. I, I know the problems there. Uh, very deep-rooted social problems, but everything is also related, unfortunately, with the form of laws and form of public policy on the issue of religious freedom. And I'd like to know your thoughts uh, on that uh, in terms of going, uh, you know, like sort of a futuristic direction. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Hi, my name is Chris Lee Hahn. Bahadir, I want to find out uh, why would a hawk who had loyally served the Indonesia people uh, want to insult and blaspheme the Indonesian non-Christian and not in Indonesia people. It doesn't make sense, this idea. And uh, isn't this a persecution of the majority or the minority? I think the, this is a very wild situation. Please explain. Uh, first question. I, I myself uh, is, is not an expert in Christianity, but uh, what I did in my speech was uh, to attract the attention of the Muslims actually that it's not that easy to label, to label uh, even non-Muslims as kafir because even uh, great scholars such as Imam Ghazali would say so. Um, if you like I can give you the reference uh, in the book of Imam Ghazali which is Fadailul Anam that I mentioned. And also Imam Ghazali in his other book, which is uh, Faisal al-Tafriqah, would say that uh, non-Muslims who are good, uh, who are a good person, who doesn't have uh, credible information about Islam, that could make him convinced about the uh, truth of Islam. Actually, has the same. Uh, possibility to be saved in the world after this world. Yeah. Uh, Imam Ghazali very specifically mentioned about this also. Uh, but I would uh, touch a little bit on the concept of uh, God and or monotheism. Yeah. Um, actually when we talk about the difference between uh, between Jawhar, substance, or that, and the concept of attributes. Uh, if we go to the concept of Tasawwuf, Imam Ghazali is a Sunni Su Sufi, but actually all Sufis in one form or another would adopt the concept of Wahdatul Wujud, uh, a kind of pantheism, but not the popular pantheism which would equate God and his creature, not at all. 
Uh, if you like to go to the concept of pantheism in the Western philosophy, you should go to Spinoza. Yeah? And you will find that uh, God in its highest level, in the level of that, is Laisaka Mithrihishai. I mean, he is totally transcendent. But then God, uh, uh, God Tajalla or Tanazala, yeah? uh, he went down to the lower levels uh, of his presence. Yeah? In Wahdatul Wujud, for instance, we have the concept of that God as the Laisa uh, Kamil the Ghaibul Ghuyub. And then the second, or the first Tanazul, the first Ta'ayun, the first, if you like, specifications of God, is Allah. Yeah, Allah called Ahadiyah. And then we have Wahidiyah, which is the level of Sifa and Asma. Yeah? And in uh, Wahdatul Wujud, God is called as Al- Al-Wahid Al-Kathir. The one and, and the many at the same time. He is one in his uh, that, he is one in his highest uh, and most transcendent existence, but in his manifestations, yeah, in his emanations, he is many. Yeah, he is many. So uh, I can understand the uh, statement of Imam Ghazali in this context, actually. If you read, for instance, Imam Ghazali's book, Mishkatul Anwar, you will find this kind of concepts in him. In him. So, uh, we would not say that, for instance, uh, God as Ahad or Allah. Allah is different with Ghaibul Ghuyub. No. Allah is the, the first ta'ayun, the first specification of God is Allah. The, the first level in which we can, we can attribute something to God, which is Allah. This is uh, Ahadiya. It doesn't mean that God in Ghaibul Ghuyub is one. That and God in the level in uh, Ahadiya is another God, and God in the level of Wahidiya is another God. So we will have too many gods. No, God is one. The rest are His manifestations. Just like uh, some philosopher would uh, give this metaphor of the sun and its light. Yeah, uh, the light of the sun would not be there except if, uh, in relation to the sun. But at the same time, we cannot say that the light is the sun. The light is different with the sun, but there is no light if there is no sun. So there is always uh, the sun and the light. This is uh, actually a metaphor used by some of the mystics to represent God like this. So even in Hinduism, it's the same thing. Brahman is the level of God, at the highest level of God, and then it has uh, manifestations. Yeah, the three or four gods and everything. The, some uh, mystics in Islam would say that the concept of God in Hinduism, but not the gods in Mahabharata, but the gods in Upanishad and Veda, would be very similar to the concept of God in Islamic uh, mysticism or Gnosticism. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot talk more uh, because I'm not a an expert in, uh, in uh, Christianity, but this is what we, uh, what I can uh, get, understand from Imam Ghazali when he say that Imam Ghazali used this word. In Indonesian language, I don't know in English or in Malaysia, uh, the Christian who adopt Christ, uh, Trinity would say that God is one, satu, tapi terdiri dari tiga oknum. I don't know if it is used here. And this is Oknum, actually it's from Arabic word, which is Oknum. The plural is Akonim. So Akonim or Oknum are not that or substance or Jauhar, but it is uh, attributes, Sifa. Yeah. Uh, that's, I think I have another, the third question is for me also. Yeah. Yeah, first of all, uh, I do not believe at all that Ahok intended to, uh, to commit blasphemy to Muslim at all. I do not have even the slightest reason that Ahok will do that. I mean, he's not a stupid person. How come he's, uh, he's competing for governorship in Jakarta, in which 90-something percent of the populations are Muslim, and he will 
commit blasphemy to. And unfortunately, this is a mixture of uh, too many complicated things, actually. Um, and I know that uh, some people, uh, some of them might believe, for instance, like the, the chairman of the Indonesian Council of Ulama, when he gave witness to the court uh, uh, in which he said that he believes that Ahok uh, has committed blasphemy to the Muslims, the judge asked him whether you have watched the video. He said, no, I haven't watched the video. This is a big problem, but Ahok has been a target. And unfortunately, I have to say that Ahok uh, doesn't have the ability of a PR person at all. He would talk his mind just like that. The first day when I saw his YouTube talking to his subordinates, and he was talking really in a very angry manner, really in my heart I said that this will create problem for him. Because people didn't see that a governor is angry towards his subordinate. But people will see that a Chinese has been uh, kurang ajar. What is kurang ajar? This is a, a rude is being like rude to an indigenous people. So, Yeah. Yeah. You can say so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a political, either the judge uh, uh, let the pressure of the people, uh, I mean, uh, to, it's not an objective decision made by him, or there uh, may be an element of politics has, that has played in the verdict on Ahok. I don't know, maybe uh, the government is planning to, uh, to get one of the Muslim figure and it will create uproar if uh, they let Ahok free and then take the, uh, one of the most famous Muslim figure, I don't know. So they put Ahok inside, now they have the reason to also take another person, I don't know. But uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is no, uh, I mean, reasonable, uh, without reasonable doubt, I con I'm convinced that Ahok actually didn't commit. But he, he is part of the problem, I have to say. With his way of talking to the people, I mean, he has created problem from the first day of his governorship in Jakarta. Now, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But uh, as, as Professor Chandra Muzaffar has uh, mentioned, actually there are other factors actually in play. Uh, you know that uh, uh, it is a fact that you cannot deny that uh, most of the Indonesian economy, or uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe 10, only like uh, less than 5% of Indonesians uh, would uh, would, um, uh, I mean, the, like 90% of Indonesian wealth is actually uh, in the hands of, I don't know, maybe 5% or less than 5%, and majority of them are from the Chinese uh, descent. You have, you have to see this. I mean, this is, not a, uh, this is not a rational reason, but I mean, this is how life is, uh, yeah. So we have to be very careful with regards to psychological, social, sociological, and psychological yeah, uh, reasons. Sorry. Yeah. No, there were there were some reports that I saw that one of the judges who presided over Ahok's case is a member of his Buttarir Indonesia, and his Buttarir Indonesia 
is one of the the groups that that uh, were very much part of the anti ahok movement in all the demonstrations that were held in Jakarta and also outside of uh, Jakarta in, in in the other cities so it's just something that I saw and I just wanted to know whether there's any uh, truth to that thank you yeah um I actually do not know for sure whether he's a member of uh, Hezbollah Tahrir, but there is a, a tweet that he has uh, tweeted before in which he shows his uh, sympathy toward, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and again, uh, with regards to uh, Hezbollah Tahrir or the Front Pembela Islam, who are among the staunchest uh, uh, Sanchez, uh, uh enemy of uh, Ahok, uh, they really believe that Ahok is uh, an extension of the hand of the uh, Chinese conglomerates in Indonesia. They really believe in this. I mean, I don't. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, their belief is uh, uh, is uh, uh, they have a basis in uh, this belief of. Ahok as being the extension of the Chinese conglomerates, but this conviction has been really uh, spread uh, among uh, a great part of the Indonesian Muslims, unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. Other question we had from the floor was actually related to the discussion we, ha we just had in, in regards to the Ahok case how to employ legal instruments uh, and um, public policies in order to ensure religious freedom as well as to tackle some of the issues in our Muslim societies. This question, um, would you like, Dr. Chandra? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I'll address just this question that came from Ali Salman about uh, religious freedom and the need for laws and so on. Well. I think the essence of the freedom of religion, the essence is something which most constitutions recognize today. Now, whether it is observed in practice, that's a different matter. But in terms of constitutional principles, the freedom to practice your own religion, and the freedom to perhaps even propagate your religion within certain confines, within a certain framework, these are recognized. What is going to become increasingly controversial all over the world, because societies are becoming consciously multi-religious everywhere. I think what is going to be a very big challenge is the limits to religious proselytization and the degree to which we uphold respect as a principle for people of other faiths. I think this is going to be a major challenge. We saw a bit of that as far as the Ahok case is concerned, but uh, we know that it's very complex and many other factors which had impacted upon it. But nonetheless, the question of respect for one another, I think that is at the root of uh, the challenge that faces us. Now, in the case of um, a concrete fabric that we're dealing with here in Malaysia, I think it is so important for us to appreciate the limits that inform all of us in a society like this. One should not run down another religion in one's eagerness to propagate one's religion. I think that's very, very important. You should not hurt their feelings. It doesn't matter whether it is a big religious community or a minor religious community. You should be very careful about facts that I think is very important rather than just distorting the truth about others. And one should not, I think, employ unethical means to spread one's faith. In other words, don't use money, don't use uh, influence, power. And this must apply to the majority as it must apply to the minorities in a particular society. In other words, the majority should not use its power. Minorities should not use their influence. 
in order to spread their religion. It happens in various situations. I remember many, many years ago when I was heading another NGO called Aliran, one of the complaints we received from a lot of Hindus and uh, Buddhists was about uh, Christian proselytization. The way in which some Christian groups were proselytizing amongst Hindus and Buddhists. Running them down and, you know, sort of uh, very crafty ways of converting people. Using illnesses, people's illnesses, using money and all the rest of it. I think that's wrong. Just as I think it's wrong for a government to make use of its power to convert, say, people from a very small indigenous uh, minority who had held on to their faith, whatever that may mean to them for centuries, and then you go around trying to convert them, I think it's wrong. So I think we should observe limits and we should observe this basic principle of respect. That I think is what is really important. Sometimes you can do it through laws, but most of the time you have to go beyond laws. It is education, it is awareness, it is basically being sensitive to the other. And this, I think, is particularly important in a multi-religious society, but it's important in all societies. We have to be sensitive to the other. You know, Dr. Chandra, if only the Muslims would understand Bismillah, Bismillah, uh, Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, it just means that uh, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Just now I heard uh, another speaker use it in another word, and this is the Jakim version. If, they, if the Muslims can understand the word most gracious, most merciful, we will have a very nice country here. There's no one stopping them from being most gracious, most merciful. We have 113 reminders at the beginning of 113 surahs. They have no excuse not to understand these two words. No excuse at all. Do you agree? Yeah. Is there any question? I mean, this yes, is very yeah. much. No, Dr. I Chandra, would you like if to... If he does agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, very quickly, you know, Elma, to our friend, I think it is um, a principle that should be practiced by everyone, Muslims and non-Muslims. And... Uh, this happens quite often in our society. There is mercy and there is compassion. Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim There's mercy, there's compassion. Sometimes we fail. But a lot of times, you know, I see this in our society. If you leave aside the politicians and power and all that, I think amongst ordinary people, I see a lot of mercy and compassion. And that gives me hope for the future. Miss that? Hi, uh, my name is Amy. I'm living in Kuala Lumpur at the moment. And uh, is the mic okay? Is it on? Yeah, it's on. Hello, hello. Yeah, it's on, right? Yeah. Um, a couple, a question for, uh, two questions for Dr. Chandra and Dr. Mohammed, and then also a question for uh, uh, Dr. Haida. Um, Just be brief, please. I will be very brief, okay. Just very quickly. Uh, very recently in Malaysia, we have the incident of uh, the poor student of the toughest school who was beaten up and he died. And, uh, and it appears as though, you know, there's not been much justice for him because um, the person who beat him up was able to get bail. Um, the school actually defended him um, and said that he was trying to repent for what he did. In your mind, uh, what does that reflect from our society that there was so little justice for this, little, this poor boy who died and he's not the, the first victim of the toughest um, school because there were other students who were very beaten up and and they died that's one and then yes. for a doctor and dr. Haida very quickly um, we see I used to live in Indonesia so I love your country um, I we see what's happening now in Ahok I mean in the larger picture you do seem to get the impression that the the hardliners seem to be gaining an upper hand um, and, uh, and, and it seemed to coincide with, with the, uh, since the death of Guzdor in December 29 uh, 2009. Uh, is this due to a vacuum left by a very great uh, moderate Muslim leader? Did NU somehow along the way uh, lose its plot and not lose its plot but sort of lose its influence in society? Thank you. Hi. Um, yes. Uh, good evening to the panel. Uh, thank you very much for an enlightening uh, forum. 
Um, my question is actually on a global scale. My name is Usha Kula. I'm a lawyer, a practicing lawyer. Uh, is on a glo on the global scale on the international front. You know, we have it, the the topic is violence and persecution in the name of religion. You see a lot of that in the MENA region, the Middle East. The schism between Shia and Sunni played out very, very directly, especially in Yemen, parts of Iraq and Syria, uh, and you can uh, and certainly supported by the powers in the region, namely Iran and Saudi Arabia. I would like the panel to to address that because that is a, a core uh, issue in the MENA region, the Middle East. Uh, the, the panel to address that issue, please, and especially, I think, perhaps Dr. Chandra Mustafa. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Actually, I've uh, written a very small article. I'm a columnist uh, from Malaysia Kini, BM, actually. Um, the title of the, my article is Tafis Jalan Pendek Ke Syurga, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it, it, I think it's, in, it's in, in, in the mentality of uh, the Malay Muslims here, uh, in Malaysia, that um, uh, we, uh, when we send children, our children to to Tafil school, um, we hope that uh, this boy or girl will become a human, yeah? uh, good Muslim, uh, memorizing Quran, whole thirty chapters. Um, and hoping that, um, because it also relates to hadith um, in uh, Sunni tradition that um, memorizing Quran, uh, the whole Quran, will uh, give benefit among other benefits uh, to, to redeem uh, at least 10 people from your nearest family uh, to heaven. Yeah? So if some, someone in hell, so if you memorize Quran so you can pick him up or her and bring him to, to heaven with you together. Uh, this is a mentality or, um, or indoctrinate uh, in uh, Malay Muslim's mind here. And, but looking at the sociological aspects of uh, the, the Tafi school, this Tafi school actually became fashionable in the 1970s especially in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, um, where uh, the syllabus are not very much about critical thinking, coming back to Pahaydar's um, words uh, previously. Uh, so the syllabus are not um, targeting the students to, 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 to coming out to, to be producing, to be Ibn Sina or Hawarizmi or the civilized Muslim scientists once uh, upon a time ago but just merely to, 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 to memorize. And memorizing something is actually a very, in the context of education, it's a, the, the, the lowest um, level of, um, you know, it's just memori memorizing, yeah? Um, and no rationalization included uh, here. But also in my art article, that, um, uh, I remind Muslims that the, the killer or the murderer of the fourth caliph, Sayyidina Ali, his name is Ibn Murjam, he is actually, uh, he memorized, he's a Hafiz, he, he memorized Quran, and he killed uh, Sayyidina Ali um, in, in, on 17th of Ramadan. And so, of course, just memorizing Quran or became a Hafiz, becoming Hafiz is not... Uh, a sole criteria uh, to be in heaven, but unfortunately, this is uh, the one that um, uh, what we have in in our society right now. Um, in fact, one of my my friends sending um, my, my school friend, actually my old school friend, sending uh, his adopted son to to Tafis, according to him, because uh, you know. Sometimes I drink, sometimes I don't pray whatsoever. So I hope my adopted son became Hafiz and one day he can help me if I'll be sent to hell. I say that, come on, if you want to go to heaven, you should enter heaven with your own merit. 
uh, I mean, you, you, you can't, uh, yeah. But this is what, the, the mentality because of um, uh, literal kind of thinking, I mean, uh, or interpretation, reading of Quran and Hadith. Uh, because we disallowed various uh, schools, yeah, uh, school of thoughts. Because everything is very institutionalized. This is another thing. Because um, one of the brother from Pakistan just now um, asking whether we we need more legal instruments. I think in Malaysian context we don't need a, a legal more legal instruments uh, because I think we have we have very enough. Uh, it's more than more than enough. Uh, or else, uh, I mean, we have many kind of fatwas. Um, about many kind of issues that actually um, suffocating uh, uh, the Muslims actually. In fact, um, Siti Qasim, I mean, she, 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 since her middle finger incident, she became so famous. I mean, her, one of her, her, her remarks is actually being Muslim uh, in Malaysia is very difficult compared to become a non-Muslim uh, in Malaysia. So, because we have uh, much, a lot of uh, policies, uh, of legal instruments, and stuff like that. So, and this is uh, the Tafis school phenomena uh, is another thing that actually, you know, um, because of the incident, uh, uh, the, I think uh, the, the authority uh, is planning to regulate uh, the Tafis school. And, um, comes to my mind that if, to regulate the Tafi school, you, you need a lot more, more, more money. And we have enough uh, a location, a huge location amount of money in our budget for Jakim. Uh, and this is a taxpayer's money. And suggesting, or proposing uh, sort of jawatan kuasa, whatsoever, policy. So, it, I mean, the, the flow of the money will definitely go, I mean, more allocation of money to, 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 to these kind of stuffs. Um, this is what, uh, I mean, I've been thinking that, uh, okay, this is opportunity to, yeah, okay, to, to channel more money, to, to direct more money to, to this uh, area, to this space. Um, it will let, uh, the, the, it's, it's like a vicious circle, so it's endless. So I think we need um, um, the education yeah, in order to, to unlock this, this mentality uh, and rationalization and critical thinking is needed here, yeah. Yeah, Amy's uh, question. I think there was some concern initially. Well, <clears throat> I think what was missing was um, a sense of outrage that this had happened, especially within education circles. And uh, there could be an explanation for that, why there wasn't this sense of outrage. I think that's what was missing a sense of outrage. And I think it could be partly because it was um, a toughie school. And uh, you had young people being trained, in memorizing the Quran, and the feeling was, uh, well, this is unfortunate, it had happened, but uh, we will not be too vocal about it. I think this is the mentality. It's partly cultural, I think. You know why there was this sort of mentality, yeah? But, let me add this point, which I think is very, very important, because it's exactly how I felt when I read about this incident. There should be no attempt at cover-up. That was my first reaction. Because of certain cultural factors surrounding our understanding of our attitude towards tafis and certain aspects of religious practice, I don't think there should be any cover-up, because here, a life was lost. And that, to my mind, is the supreme principle when it comes to human rights. It's human life. It's human life. You know, life was lost. There must be a proper inquiry. The truth must be made known to the public, and action should be taken based upon a thorough, honest, just, fair investigation. I think that is what is needed as far as this is concerned. The jury is still out because uh, the whole thing is not over yet. Let's wait and see what happens after this. And in the meantime, I hope that more 
individuals who are connected with religion as such will also speak up. It has not been happening. I hope they will speak up on this uh, particular issue. All right, now the question from Usha, I think, uh, about, uh, sorry, yeah, about the Sunni Shia divide and what's happening in West Asia. You mentioned specific countries, Ye Yemen, Iraq, Syria, and so on. Part of it I've already addressed, Nusha, in my presentation. It's basically geopolitics. It's connected with uh, power, Saudi versus Iran, but also, I think, uh, issues connected with the actors outside the Arab world. Uh, within that region called Wana, West Asia, North Africa, Turkey is also involved. And uh, Turkey is not an Arab country, and of course, Iran is not an Arab country. And then you also have, of course, uh, Britain, the United States, uh, France, you know, they've all got vested interests. Is there a way of resolving this larger challenge? Some years ago, 2005, I'm sure you're aware of this, a large number of um, Sunni and Shia scholars and political leaders came together to produce what was known as the Amman message. The Amman message. I think the Amman message actually offers a lot of hope. It is a very well-crafted document which rises above all these divisions and talks basically about uh, the common message of uh, Islam. And um, some of the people who are now involved in this type of um, antagonism between Sunnis and Shias, actually they were part of the Amman message. And many others who were signatories to the Amman message, instead of speaking up, they've all chosen to keep quiet, including leaders from Malaysia. Former leaders, some are still present, you know, leaders for instance, to be very frank, candid about this, uh, our former Prime Minister, Tun Abdullah Badawi, is a signatory to the Amman message, which talks about bringing everyone together. But in the midst of all that has been happening, he has been very quiet. Tun Abdullah has been very quiet. I mean, he should speak up on issues like this. The other person who is also a signatory to the Amman message is uh, Kairi Jamaluddin. <laughs> so you find that... Uh, Kairi Jamaluddin also hasn't said anything as far as these uh, divisions are concerned because I suppose, and this is the tragedy actually, not just in Malaysia but all over the world and not just among Muslims but people everywhere. When it comes to your own interests, you keep quiet. You're not sure whether it's politically useful to speak up. So you choose to keep quiet, which I think is very unfortunate. I really feel that uh, the signatories to the Aman message should speak up. And others should also speak up. It's very important. Uh, and it will carry some weight. And if you had more and more people who were prepared to do that, you know, we made a, an effort of sorts. You may be aware of this, you know, Usha. Way back in 2013, May 2013, uh, I helped to draft a statement which uh, Tun Mahade, Muhammad, as a leader of the Sunnis, he had been prominent at one time, and... Uh, the former president of Iran, Muhammad Khatami, they signed this statement and we tried to publicize it. But you know how difficult it was to get some Muslim majority countries to even give you know, half a paragraph in their newspapers to this statement. We translated it into six languages. But what can you do? Our resources are limited, but even if we had more resources, we would not have been able to get people to access this message because there is a certain mental framework, a mental block here. And what is that mental block? The moment Sunnis and Shias kill one another, it will be news, be publicized. The moment there's an attempt to bring people together, the media is not interested. It's like what they say in the media, when a dog bites a man, it's uh, not news, you see. But when a man bites a dog, then it becomes news. So something like that has to happen. You just have to kill one another, it becomes news. But efforts of this sort, there is no traction. This, I think, is a problem. Uh, perhaps, Dr. Chandra, 
the understanding of the Surah Al Maun, which means a neighborly assistance, uh, people cannot understand the footnote 1860, which means making a show of their piety in every good deed, which is not for the sake of Allah, but to achieve other objectives. Maybe this is the reason. Neighborly assistance means give to my father-in-law and give to me, not to others. Yes, perhaps this is the understanding. Must have been the education system. And nowadays it seems that uh, every event, every occurrence, every happening, it's nothing except complicated. I mean, uh, yes, the death of uh, Gustur is, is a very great loss to Indonesian Muslims as well as the death of Nur Khalis Majid. But the situations nowadays is also very much different with the time of Gustur. At the time of Gustur, when, when Gustur was alive, did anyone imagine that the United States will elect someone like Donald Trump, for instance? I mean, situation is also uh, is becoming much more complicated. This is this uh, problem of xenophobia. I mentioned a little bit about Brexit, Pauline Han Hansen, La Pen, Modi, uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned before, the phenomenon of Islamic radicalism, which happens also in other religions, uh, as uh, also explained by uh, Professor Sandra Muzaffar. Actually, this is uh, the, the child of the era. This is the child of the era. Uh, that's one. I mean, the situation now is much more complicated. If Gusdur is still alive, Nur Khalis Majid is still alive, maybe uh, uh, both of them can contribute to make the situation as uh, not as bad as what we have now. But still, I think the turnout of events has taken us to a much more complicated situation nowadays. But you are correct in saying that actually the government, uh, the government was uh, actually not knowledgeable enough about the situations. I mean, they have underestimated the situations. I was uh, invited to, uh, to meet President Jokowi, and he's uh, sat exactly opposite of uh, me. And I said to him, uh, bluntly, I said, the government has been too slow, the government has been too lenient. I mean, I don't, uh, I don't suggest to the government that they would uh, do anything uh, and not uh, not uh, respecting human rights, no. I mean, Indonesia is a democracy. Uh, the rights of the people uh, have to be respected and everything. But, I mean, we need, we need a strong government also. And unfortunately, it seems like the Jokowi's cabinet uh, was underestimating the situations. When they realized this, the situation has been uh, has been a bit out of control. Now they are trying to regain control, but uh, too many factors has been uh, in play, and it will be a very difficult uh, situation for the government of Jokowi now. Uh, but uh, as you see, also uh, one of the problems are everywhere, any time in the history of mankind, usually the moderates would not uh, would not be awakened before the situation is getting too bad. I mean, when the situation is worse like now, the moderates would uh, be awakened. And now we see that in Indonesia, uh, the, uh, this uh, this recent uh, recent uh, yeah yeah. Yeah now, yeah, now really has awakened the moderates in Indonesia, and we hope that it would not take us to a frontal conflict between the two groups, but hopefully it will reach a new balance in which uh, both groups would negotiate and uh, once again uh, give democracy a chance in Indonesia, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, my name is Adriana, I'm a corporate lawyer. My question basically is for Dr. Faisal, but I think all the panelists had actually mentioned that uh, what I found interesting was you mentioned about critical thinking and education. 
Uh, can you elaborate a little bit more? Because my observation is how I've been educated here locally compared to one year brief masters in the UK was here right from small until even university level, you memorize a lot and you vomit it out back. Critical thinking is, uh, critical thinking is allowed uh, to a certain limit because most of the teachers per perhaps uh, cannot accommodate students who are overly critical, critical in their thinking or they themselves are too lazy. So, you know, if you want to expect the government to actually uh, start initiating that, even I think most governments don't really want citizens who are overly critical over a lot of issues because you don't want to disrupt the balance of power, be it spiritual, religious, financial, whatever power there is. Okay. So how do we actually want to inculcate that? And what my observation is if we want to wait to have critical thinking at the university level or even when we are all already working and attending forums like our IRF is a little bit too late. So how can yeah, we have think. such critical thinking? You know, have, have not just the teachers basically, governments, all civil society to start looking at changing our education system from the grassroots basically, thanks. Uh, oh yeah, um, uh, I sent my children to Sekola Kebangsaan, so not inter any international schools. Um, and uh, the very first week, and my daughter in Standard 1, um, she told me that the uh, teachers uh, doesn't allow her to actually ask a lot of questions. Uh, but before that, uh, in kindergarten, the teachers are uh, like encouraging the ch children, uh, you can ask anything, ask, ask, ask. But uh, in Sekolah Kebangsaan, I mean, it's just like uh, one month holiday, school school holiday. I mean, and then she 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 she's now in school like a bounce. And suddenly, teachers are saying, "Ah, oh, no, you cannot, um, you cannot ask questions." Um, for for me myself, uh, I encourage my children to ask uh, because I have this concept beriman dari tanya, meaning that. Uh, uh, if you want to become uh, beriman, yeah, faithful, you have, you believe in something, um, you need to believe it because of you believe it, not just because I impose it to you. Um, I educate my ch children that way, um, but of course, uh, our education systems are not su that supportive. I mean, like uh, the moment she 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 going out to school, she. I mean, at home, when we send her to school. So it's going to be different. And also, um, for the very first month in January, I sent my daughter to uh, Sekolah Agama, Kafa, the morning school, you know, with the green, kain, and uh, tudung, whatsoever. And my daughter chose to sit uh, uh, in front row. And besides her, is actually a boy. And the Ustazah says that you cannot sit here because you cannot sit beside a boy. You need to uh, sit behind. Uh, girls always sit behind. Uh, and my girl says that no. I mean, my father says that uh, you can, I can sit anywhere and uh, I'm allowed to do, you know. Uh, and so who's your father? I mean, he's, he's, he's outside. And the Ustazah is looking and says, oh, okay. Faisal Tehrani, I know him. So, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's difficult, of course. But um, um, it's like, but it's endless. I mean, uh, the thing is, we need to, to do it at home, basically, uh, to, 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 to nourish our children. Um, yeah, it's everyone's responsibility. Yeah, yes. I agree with you because, or else, the ministers of education will change, and it will change, and um, the thing is, <laughs> it's it's endless uh, the, the 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 problems, and uh, I don't know whatever. I mean, after this, they will change more policies and, and staffs and others. So, but uh, the the contact hours with our children, so uh, that's very much needed. That we we need to 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 educate them, uh, to to challenge, to be critical. Um, that is what. Uh, at least um, as individual uh, I'm doing for the benefit of the society. And I think if every parent's doing that, um, I think in 10 or 20 years we need, a, we will have a, a, a very uh, different kind of societies um, 
hopefully, yeah. I guess uh, we are calling it a day. Um, we thank the panel guests again. Thank you very much, Dr. Chandra Muzaffar, Dr. Haidar Bagir, and Dr. Faisal. Thank you um, to the audience also for sharing your time with us and sharing your questions. We invite you all for refreshments um, at the side here. Take your time, talk to each other, and hopefully we have contributed something on this pressing topic. Thank you again. <laughs>